Havade, I'm Amanda Dedicatoria from the Pacific News Center here with Senator Clinton Rigel on co Coffee with the Candidates. So, um, yeah, Senator, would you like to just introduce yourself to our aud audience? Sure. <clears throat> so, hi, uh, my name is Clinton Rigel. I'm a senator serving my first term as senator, and um, I'm running for re-election, and I hope that uh, the public will deem me um, suitable for re-election. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So awesome. So Senator, you just finished your first term and considering everything that you've learned so far, uh, what issues will you tackle if re-elected? Sure. Uh, so what I really want to focus on, and I've started to now currently, is uh, agriculture and developing an agricultural industry on Guam. Uh, that was a big part of my platform when I ran the first time around. I wasn't able to get as much accomplished as I wanted to in terms of developing agriculture on Guam. I was focused on some other areas of my platform that I was able to get accomplished. Uh, so now I'm really shifting my focus to agriculture. I believe that um, right now Guam is importing 90% of our food. And I think uh, we need to start growing our own food and producing our own food. I think it'll create uh, new business opportunities new jobs and new revenues for Guam. Mm -hmm. And considering the economic impact of the, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, taking a and with the tourism industry taking a really huge hit, why do you think it's important to diversify our econ economy in that way? Sure. Um, yeah, I think COVID has shown us, COVID-19 has shown us why it's important to diversify because if we put all our eggs into one basket, so to speak, you know, if you drop that basket, you break all those eggs. So right now, pretty much all of our eggs are in the tourism basket. You could say we have tourism, military, and <clears throat> uh, you know, federal spending are the main things. Government, GovGuam spending, federal spending, and tourism are sort of the main things we have driving our economy. Um, so tourism is one of the number one, is the real number one industry we have, local industry here. And we see with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, tourists stop coming. Uh, that makes in our number one industry suffer. So we need to, that's why we need to diversify so that we put our eggs into more than one basket and spread them out so that if we drop one basket of eggs, we still got some other baskets of eggs left. Mm -hmm. Of course, and you know, with that in mind, uh, how would you have better handled the economic crisis and other issues caused by the pandemic? Great question. Um, so I think the best way to have handled uh, the pandemic prior to it happening or while it's happening is to have had created <clears throat> other industries. And so that's uh, precisely why my platform when I ran for office, a lot of it was centered on creating new industries. And that's why I pushed and passed the Cannabis uh, uh, Industry Act to do just that. Um, that was done in my first year in office, my first few months in office. And so that's why my platform was real big on developing a cannabis industry and an agriculture industry on Guam as well, because we need to develop these other industries that we can uh, go to in times of crisis like this. So um, would the agriculture also include like industries like aquaculture too? Absolutely, yeah. So when I say agriculture, I often think of aquaculture as a sub <clears throat> industry within agriculture. Some may say they're two separate industries, uh, you could argue that, but I in my mind, I view it all as one industry is agriculture and underneath agriculture, you'd have aquaculture, you could have permaculture, you could have uh, so many different types of agriculture fall under that. I believe cannabis falls under that too as well. To me, that's a cash crop that falls under the overall agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of resources that we already have here uh, would you use to kind of jumpstart that industry? Like, would you consult the university or like anything like that? Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, I've been consulting with the uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Guam Department of Agriculture, <clears throat> Guam Economic Development Authority. I've been meeting with the various farmers organizations on Guam, the Farmers Co-op, um, as well as other farmer organizations on Guam. There's the Southern Soil uh, Water Conservation District and the Northern District as well that's made up of farmers. I've met with both of those uh, boards. <clears throat> and so. I've been engaging uh, a lot with the farmers, uh, with the University of Guam as well, to sort of bring all 
bring all this brain power to the table and let's figure out what really needs to be done for agriculture. And what I've been finding in the course of a lot of my meetings with the various people that are involved with agriculture currently is that there's no one sort of silver bullet that would fix it. <clears throat> there's numerous things we have to do to really truly develop the industry and get this industry off the ground. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess what are some of the, the issues that um, these farmers have been running into like that would prevent them from kind of bolstering the industry itself? Sure, I, I can name one right off the bat. And as a matter of fact, uh, I have a piece of legislation that I'll be introducing shortly uh, to address it. And what it is is a lot of farmers have told me that the system development charge for water <clears throat> is too expensive. And it's, very, it's just very costly. And so say they want to, uh, so when they're putting in new pipes and stuff to irrigate their farm and to, if to say if someone's got a large piece of land and they need to uh, put pipes in there and put meters in there to start uh, irrigating the land, they need to pay these system development charges that can sometimes add up depending on how large their land is and how long the piping is, etc. Um, so those system development charges are very expensive and they deter people from even wanting to farm their land. Even if they may have a lot of land sitting there, they just don't have the money up front to put in the piping and to pay the system development charge. So I'm um, going to be introducing a bill very shortly that will address that by allowing for amortization of the system development charge. In other words, allow them to spread out payments. And this has come to me directly from farmers uh, and people who are interested in farming who have said, if you just give us time to pay it. we don't." say give it to us for free, although I personally think they should get it for free, but a lot of farmers have said we're willing to just pay it over time, spread out the payments, give us time to spread out almost like a loan, how you would do a loan, right? Amortize it over time. So I have a bill to do that. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. So uh, I guess because of the pandemic there's been some concerns that the island could experience a brain drain where our most skilled people could just move away. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done by our government to address the rising cost of living and encourage skilled and edu educated people to stay here. Absolutely, yeah, I think the first thing to encourage skilled and educated people to work here is we need to develop these job opportunities, develop these industries to keep them here. Um, <clears throat> so in developing those industries, we'll develop job opportunities to keep them here so that we can keep some of the best and brightest to help figure out how to create an agriculture industry here on Guam, how to open agricultural businesses, um, how to open cannabis businesses, right? Um, in addition to that, I think we need to work quickly to uh, get tourism back on track as quickly as possible. Uh, that's not going to be easy, but it's also not impossible, and there are ways to do it. And I think the number one way to do it, uh, again, it's going to take numerous things, but I think the number one key issue is we have to assure our source markets of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan that Guam is a safe destination for visitors. And how do we do that is we have to meet and engage with them. And at the same time, we also have to um, show them that we're doing a lot of the same things here on Guam that they do in their home countries. And I think we've already adopted a lot of those practices like wearing masks. Uh, if you go to uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, they wear masks all the time. Uh, they've been doing it since the SARS and MERS outbreaks, um, which is just a related disease. It's a, co a coronavirus disease, right? So we also, I think, we need to improve testing and contact tracing. Now, I think we've done a lot of testing already. I still think we can do some more testing. I think perhaps maybe even test at the airport. Now, I know some members of the tourism industry don't think that's a good idea. Um, so we've kind of held back on that, but uh, we, that may be something we might have to do. Uh, if, that's what, if that's what it's gonna take to convince our source markets that we're safe, then I say we should do it. Um, now, uh, another one is digital contact tracing. So contact tracing is a huge part of what they do in Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong even, and Japan, right? So um, they do that a lot through digital, con they do their contact tracing through a lot of digital contact tracing, but they have apps that you can download. I've actually just introduced a bill with uh, co-sponsors, uh, several co-sponsors, uh, Senator Pito Terlahi, uh, Speaker Tina Munya Barnes, and Senator Will Castro. We've introduced a bill that would allow Guam to be able to do digital contact tracing, but only on a voluntary basis. But at the same time, what we could employ that, uh, the way we could employ it is we could have anyone who comes in at the airport, currently if you don't have a test within 72 hours of coming from a hot spot, you're sent to a government quarantine facility, right? Or if you have that test and it shows you negative, you can go home quarantine, right? So I say we add another layer to that too. We add the digital contact tracing and say now if you want to be home quarantined, you have to download a digital contact tracing app or else you can go to the government quarantine facility. But if you want to stay home and quarantine, download this app because the app will help us to keep track of you and keep track of where you're going.
Yeah, that sounds so exciting. And um, I guess in line with that, um, so you were a journalist and you've been, you've been known like to grace all the newsrooms and be on the street like interviewing um, the people of Guam. What is your stance on governmental transparency and accountability? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm huge on government transparency and accountability. I think we absolutely need to have government transparency and accountability. Um, and I think, um, in all my years of reporting, I think this is the most government transparency and accountability that we've had in a long time. And people may disagree, but I remember when I was a reporter, it was so hard to get information for so many things. Now information is everywhere because social media. So now even if the government wants to be non-transparent, someone's going to post it to social media. Uh, we saw that, for example, with uh, recently there was an issue with Gura. Some Gura employees were apparently taking a government vehicle. In the past, pre-social media, we would have never heard about it. No one would have ever known. Now, all it took was someone to take that video of those Gura employees at the eating at a restaurant with the government vehicle and that went viral and that forced Gura now to come out and say yes uh, we are looking into it there were employees that were there we're doing an investigation it sort of forced them before no one would have ever heard about it so social media has forced the government to be more accountable and to be more transparent that is awesome uh, and so like just taking in your your experience so far um, what do you think you could have done better in your in your previous term and what will you do better if you're re-elected? Absolutely. Um, so focusing more on development of agriculture. Yeah, I wasn't able to do that as much in my first term. I was focused on a lot of other things in my first term, uh, cannabis, as well as uh, uh, renewable energy. I was really doing a lot with the Guam Power Authority and employing renewable energy. We managed to get a bill passed that uh, requires 100% renewable energy. So a lot of my focus was on that. A lot of focus was on the CCU and the PUC and the issues with the power plant that uh, they decided to build. So I spent a lot of time focused on that and I, I feel like uh, I should have focused more on developing agriculture. So that's something I would have done better and that's why I'm, that's actually a big reason why I'm running again. It's because I feel I wasn't able to do enough with agriculture. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you so much for your time, Senator. And thank you for staying tuned with, the, with Coffee with the Candidates. Please stay tuned for more.